Hello, welcome everyone to this crash course in climate migration, how journalists can tell impactful stories, hold governments accountable and investigate solutions. My name is Lucienne Noel. I'm a coastal resilience expert with Earth Journalism Network and a senior associate at Miyamoto International. Uh, for those of you who may be new to Earth Journalism Network or EJN, um, EJN has a mission to improve the quality and quantity of journalism around the world. Um, based on uh, focus on the environment. It does this by helping journalists report on climate change, biodiversity, conservation, pollution, and other issues through grants, fellowships, and other kinds of support. EJN is a community of more than 14,000 journalists in 180 countries. If you're not a member and you'd like to be one, please visit earthjournalism.net. By registering, you'll be the first to hear about grants, fellowships, and events like this webinar today. Um, today's topic is designed for journalists interested in telling nuanced stories about climate migration and investigating whether proposed solutions are equitable, scalable, sustainable, and replicable. We know that by 2050, an estimated 140 million people across Africa, Asia, and Latin America will be driven from their homes by extreme weather events, rising seas, and food insecurity. Just recently, we saw the floods in Pakistan displace somewhere near a million people at once. These numbers are hard for us to even wrap our minds around, but every one of those millions of people have a story to tell that would help the world understand the urgency of action, seek out solutions, and even begin discussion around climate justice. This webinar today is a special extended session. It will be um, an hour and a half uh, with extended conversation and a question and answer session after three brief conversations. Um, I would like to introduce our three speakers that we have today. First up, we have Manuel Marquez Pereira. He is the head of Division for Migration, Environment, Climate Change, and Risk Reduction within the Department of Peace and Development Coordination for the International Organization for Migration, IOM. Previously, he was the Deputy Chief and Mission Head of Office in Cox Bazar with IOM Bangladesh. Manuel has also worked with IOM in Timor-Leste, the Philippines, Iraq, Pakistan, Mozambique, among many others, focus on displacement, camp coordination and management, humanitarian assistance, disaster risk reduction, and early recovery. Manuel is a Portuguese national with a master's in emergency practice and development and a bachelor's in environmental engineering. He speaks Portuguese, English, Spanish, French, and Tatum. Uh, next up, we will have Ritu. Ritu is the principal researcher climate for the climate change group within the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. Ritu has more than 20 years of senior policy development, research and management experience in government, funding agencies and international NGOs. She has worked on climate resilience, resource conservation, social protection, migration and gender. Her work influences strategy for institutions, governments, and international development and humanitarian organizations. Her experience spans across climate change, disaster risk reduction, and migration, and how it interacts with climate. She has a particular understanding on how to align development and social protection programs to prevent climate-induced displacement and distress migration. And finally, we have Liz Russell with us, the Louisiana State Director at the Environmental Defense Fund. Liz leads the development and implementation of political strategies to stabilize global climate, build defenses against extreme weather, and reduce exposure to air pollution and chemicals. Previously, Liz was a climate justice director, program director at Foundation for Louisiana, working to build people power and advance just policies in support of economic opportunity, environmental justice, and equitable development. As a New Orleans native, Liz is no stranger to disaster. With a background in architecture, her design proficiencies range from construction to community engagement, ecological design, and feature planning. Before we begin, I just want to briefly go over two um, quick housekeeping um, notices. One is that this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to rewatch on EJN's website in the next few days, and all registered attendees will receive that email notification when that's ready. Um, the second is that following presentations from our speakers, we will be opening it up to audience questions. Um, for those watching live, please do put your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen and not in the chat box. We will be monitoring the Q&A and pulling, from, pulling our questions from there, um, but we will not be monitoring the chat. 
Um, so that is enough of me. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter, Manuel. Thank you, Lucien, uh, and hello, dear journalists. Um, allow me to uh, talk to you, and I think we have some slides now that we will uh, that we will put up. I'm sure, I cannot see. Well, I will I will advance the the conversation so that we don't lose much time. The slides are less relevant. First of all, allow me to congratulate uh, the Earth Journalism Network for organizing this crash course on climate migration and to give us the opportunity to share our perspectives and our work. Uh, we have been engaging in research, policy, advocacy, capacity building, and extensive operations in the area of migration, environment, climate change, and disaster risk reduction since the night. Um, IOM has three core objectives when we are talking about addressing migration on these specific contexts. Firstly, to develop solutions for people to move. Secondly, to develop solutions for people on the move. And thirdly, to develop solutions for people to stay. This broad division, well, this division of work is to help characterize the mobility status of individuals, is not a static perspective, but it's a flexible approach that allows us to support these individuals. There's a lot of misconceptions about human mobility in the context of disasters, climate change, and environmental degradation. This is still a challenge, how we present mobility and the right to choose mobility in a positive way. In this context, we would like to recognize and applaud the commitment of all <clears throat> of all the journalists here, is it very important to tell impactful stories? As our colleague said just now about Pakistan, it's a massive tragedy. There's a lot of histories that come forward. It's very important that you bring this human dimension to climate change. We need to ensure that governments are accountable and that we instigate solutions that are effective for individuals. Our work is essentially to challenge and rethink the narrative on climate migration. What do we mean when you talk about climate migration? Uh, you will be able to see on, on, on the slides uh, a definition that IOM works. The second slide is a definition of how IOM characterizes climate migration, right? Uh, we refer to a movement of a person or groups of persons who predominantly for reasons of sudden or progressive change in the environment due to climate change are obliged to leave their habitual place of residence or choose to do so either temporary or permanently within a state or across an international border. So our angle is mobility is natural. Mobility can be, pos it can be positive if well-informed and if voluntary. Sometimes is forced, but when it's forced, needs other mechanisms of support. So before we dive into data, allow me to address a few of the common misconceptions of the topic that have serious consequences for people and for the responses we are trying to create. Firstly, mobility decisions are inherently multi-casual. This means that environmental factors are only a part of what drives migration and displacement. And it needs to be understood in the light of social, political, economical, and demographic factors. Climate change impacts more specifically show as a risk multiplier. They exacerbate other causes of forced and voluntary migration. Second, man-made factors shape impacts of climate hazards, including the need and the ability to move. If individuals have the resources and the information they can move, and even the physical conditions of moving are depending on external factors. Thirdly, human mobility in the context of disasters, climate change, and environmental degradation takes various forms. It can be temporary or permanent, forced or voluntary. In proximity, or at a larger distance, including international movements. And so these movements tendentially are localized. They are internal inside the countries or within the region in neighborhood countries. They are in small scale internationally. 
is a misconception that large numbers of people will migrate, migrate too far from the areas of their current uh, residence. Based on the evidence that we have, we need to debunk together this common narrative that climate change will lead to large numbers of migrants crossing borders. We have no direct proof that that will be the case. We have direct proof of regional and high local mobility, rural, urban, rural, rural, from at-risk areas to safer areas, including permanent relocation, but not across large extents of large distances because of the resource, resources and the capacity to do so. In 2021 alone, we should also understand that the majority of the people that have moved and that we see um, reported as move are directly linked with disasters, what we call onset hazards, natural hazards. And so in 2021 alone, disasters created 23.7 million new internal displacements. You will be able to have some data on the second slide, the top lines of data. In East Asia and the Pacific, more specifically, disasters triggered 13.7 million internal displacements. This is the highest figure since 2016 and represents the visible aspect of many of the disasters that happened in Asia Pacific, in Asia Pacific last year. The region accounted for the majority of disaster displacements recorded worldwide. And they could have been as simple as evacuations of a cyclone in the Philippines Philippines or Bangladesh to an evacuation center and the majority of the population returning back. But it still counts as a displacement. All over the world, cyclone storms and floods made more than 21.5 million new internal displacements. How these people stayed displaced or returned home or moved somewhere is a much more complex number to get because it's very difficult to track at individual level and to report these large numbers of people. But we are focusing today on coastal communities and coastal communities recurrently face extreme exposure to cyclones, sea level rise, water logging and other hazards. 800 million people are expected to be living in urban areas that will be affected by sea level rise by 2050. However, we also have to be careful with the numbers, as do they not provide a full picture. I told you that 18 million people are expected to be at risk due to sea level rise. This does not mean that these people will be displaced, means that they are at risk if we don't do anything. First, because there is no direct casualty between human mobility, in this case, sea level rise. And second, because not all people at risk will want to leave or will have the opportunity or may want to do. Some of them may actually be immobile, what we call trapped populations, becoming even more vulnerable. Um, let me give you an example from a rural area. I, I have recently been to Bangladesh where I worked for a visit and I met some families at the shores of the Bay of Bengal. These fishermen or salt farmer families have limited land rights and economical capacities and they live less than 500 meters from the shore and they are only protected by a large earth embankment. Uh, when discussing disaster preparedness, Asma, who is 60, told me that without a husband and sons, her house, um, and a very simple house is her only possession. And so if floods or a cyclone comes, she stays home to secure a shelter and will only move to the safety of an evacuation shelter if the water reaches her chest or higher, putting her life in direct risk. If not, she prefers to stay home. She prefers to take care of her possessions. Governments, and this example is clear, need to adopt suitable policies and practices. This includes disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation measures. I will give you another example. The government of Bangladesh has also invested significantly on the evacuation systems. They have a program called Cyclone Preparedness Program. In conjunction with the government of Bangladesh, IOM invested in improving this shelter 
and the improving this shelter system for the evacuation of individuals, but at the same time, strengthening the quality of the houses, the shelters of these individuals and supporting livelihood diversification. This has enabled families like Asma to have a better adaptive capacity. They have a house that is less affected by disasters. They have different livelihoods opportunities that they can take in case a disaster floods the salt plains or enables them from fishing. And evacuation centers are functional in case they have to take refuge in the same. At the same time, Migration can be also a solution to cope with these changes in the environment. This is why it's essential to develop solutions for people to move and for people on the move. In this context, IOM is taking forward with partners a program to enhance the protection and empowerment of migrants and communities affected by climate change and disasters in the Pacific region. The program is supporting the development of a regional framework to address these issues and is also working with communities affected by climate change to increase access to labor mobility schemes so that people can move in the region and have new livelihoods opportunity without feeling or being trapped in areas extremely vulnerable to climate change. This is not, it's only an option of last resort, what I'm going to say now, planned relocation, right? And so when the situation is critical, there is no more adaptive capacity, the risks are extreme, more and more countries, specifically in coastal areas and in, in island areas, are taking resource of planned relocation. And planned relocation is emerging as a critical policy concern for governments and a key, pol a key action from the same as sea level rises, erode shorelines in coastal and coastal communities and hampers access to potable water. For example, the Solomon Islands just developed a, settle, a set of planned relocation guidelines in a collaboration with IOM and over 300 representatives of the government, civil society and community representatives. These guidelines help the government and all the actors understand better the opportunities, the risks, and the challenges of moving entire communities and making them safe and viable communities. But they present opportunities uh, in situations of extreme risk. I will stop here with the examples. I thank you all for your attention and I look forward for our discussion. There is more information that you can access in the contacts that are attached. We will make sure that they arrive to you also by email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you for that global perspective and for uh, correcting some of the misconceptions around climate migration. Uh, next up, we have Ritu, uh, who will speak about some of the social impacts of migration. Thank you so much, Lucien. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, we see it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I am Ritu Bhardwaj, and I'll be talking about the impacts of climate change on migration trends and some of the consequences that it leads to and why it's urgent uh, to address. So starting off, I, um, you know, the, the nature and the trend of climate impact is changing in the recent time. And how it's changing um, is, you know, it's increasing in magnitude. Everyone must, be, must have read this news around Pakistan floods. Almost one third of the country was underwater. That's an impact on unprecedented uh, scale. It hasn't been witnessed before in those countries. Similarly, uh, these climate impacts are increasing in their intensity or frequency. For example, the same Bay of Bengal, um, and we'll talk about Bangladesh, the same Bay of Bengal used to receive one cyclone in two years, now it receives two cyclone in one year. And, and, and the communities are hardly able to recover from one cyclone and they are hit by another. So they are in a perpetual mode of recovery. Similarly, there are locations in Caribbean which never witnessed uh, drought are witnessing drought for the first time. They experience floods. Now they're experiencing drought. They just don't know how to handle them. So increasingly, many of these climate impacts are falling in the category of loss and damage, where the communities or the countries are no longer able to cope with them, no longer able to recover from them. And, and these losses and damages, they don't occur in isolation. 
Uh, they occur along with a lot of development deficits that many of these countries are already facing. They have lack of infrastructure, simple infrastructure that can protect them even from low intensity parts of cyclones that's not available to them. Similarly, drought early warning system or cyclone early warning system, or even social protection that can save communities when they're exposed to such crisis. So, you know, you always have to look at some of these climate impacts on top of the existing uh, in the, uh, existing situations in many of these countries. And, and, you know, so what we did, we tried to understand how, and, and the sad tale about loss and damage is we don't have enough evidence out there uh, that can really tell you what are the realities of loss and damage. Um, so, so what we did, we, we tried to understand we, uh, the, the impact that loss and damage kind of climate impacts. And, you know, why I'm saying loss and damage? Because you have to understand the difference between climate impacts that can be adopted, adapted to, that can be coped. And there are clearly certain climate impacts that just cannot be coped with because they're socially not possible, technically unfeasible. It cannot be addressed through mitigation or adaptation. Manuel went at length of how sea level rise is increasing. So this is something if sea level is increasing your, your land and your houses are going underwater, how do you cope with that? So they're typically, these are residual risks. So, and we try to capture what are the realities, how are countries and communities really facing in 12 different geographies, which I'm uh, shown on the, on the slide there, and try to understand how are they really getting impacted? What are the realities of loss and damage? And we saw that, yeah, of course, almost in all of those 12 contexts, which were facing glacial lake outbursts to desertification, sea level rise, drought, and a range of climate impacts, they were all facing some sort of loss of life, dam uh, damage to their properties, infrastructure, and so on. But there was one consequence, one impact, which was common across all 12 geographies, irrespective of the kind of climate impact they were facing. That was almost every community was either faced for to forced displacement or distress migration. And especially when poor and vulnerable communities were forced to migrate, undertake distress migration, and they did not have a social safety net, they were subjected to exploitation or were exposed to the risk of slavery or trafficking and so on. So we also did another research last year where we tried to understand where is it that this three issues really meet? Where, how does this nexus exist? And we try to find out where climate migration and vulnerability slavery intersect and we found there were at least three pathways where it happens. First, in the case of an aftermath of sudden disasters. When I say sudden disasters, it typically includes cyclones, floods, and hurricanes. Typically, where people are forced to, they're hit by a sudden event and they're forced to leave their homes and take refuge in shelters, relief camps, and so on. And there are ample evidence where we've seen that trafficking or slavery issues increases in the aftermath of such events. For example, Typhoon Haiya in Philippines, Cyclone Sidra in Bangladesh. The second pathway where we saw this nexus to exist was in the case of slow onset event. For example, droughts, sea level rise, uh, coastal erosion, and so on, where communities which are dependent on natural resources for their livelihood, they gradually see their, their livelihood resource base eroding, and they ultimately reach a tipping point where they, they are exposed to even pushed into debt bondage, bonded labor, and then they have no other means, but you know, even if it is risky, they do pursue some of those uh, migratory opportunities. And the third that we saw was in the case where these climatic events, when they combine with conflict-like situations, or one of the case studies we heard was from uh, Lake Chad Basin, where we saw that although Boko Haram uh, issues are there, and that has caused a lot of displacement, but one of the first displacements happened in the region because of climate impacts. So, you know, so you know, you can always access more details about these 12 case studies in the in the publication that I mentioned below. But we try to understand how, you know, just to explain to you how the nexus exists, I'll just quickly present two case studies. One is from Urichar in Bangladesh, uh, which is prone to cyclone flooding and coastal erosion. And when we when we collected this information from there, almost every household there had been displaced at least minimum three to maximum seven times. And even people who used to be affluent or had decent resources, over the years, every time they got displaced, their the resources started to erode. And now they're gradually being pushed into vulnerability. And family, when they see that their houses or the land is getting eroded, they rush to marry off their daughter, resulting in many child marriages, 
especially women, are then exposed to gender-based violence, uh, exploitation, and abuse. The second case study is from Kendra Pada in Orissa, uh, uh, where we actually collected a lot of ground-level data, like in terms of uh, quantitative data as well. And we saw that uh, this area is exposed to cyclone, flooding, sea level rise, and salination. And one, you know, I'm not going to go through each and every figure, it's out there on the slide, but this area actually saw, you know, in many, I'm not using the word climate refugees, but this is an area which saw the, one of the first victims of sea level rise in India, where last of the seven villages, it's a group of seven villages that disappeared in 2011, and then the government actually saw that the communities were uh, to, the, to being displaced, they settled them at about 12 kilometers away in Bhagat Patiari settlement colony. And 10 years down the line, these communities are again forced to move because most of their land is either sand casted or salinated. And there were two more villages in a study area, which where, which where the sea coast was 2.5 kilometers away a few years back. Now it is 1.5 kilometers away. So what I'm trying to show here is that these communities are are forced to displacement again and again, because, and, and this is going to increase more as sea level rises, as they face coastal erosion and, and are exposed to more frequent cyclones and flooding. And, and when people, and, and I'm also going to come, come to the extent of migration and vulnerability to slavery, uh, and what are the underlying drivers to them? So firstly, the kind of uh, trafficking or you know or slavery because the Indian government didn't allow us to use the word slavery, but we still like many of the conditions in which these migrants were working uh, were akin to uh, modern slavery like conditions. For example, dead migrants, bonded labor, forced labor, dead bondage, and so on. Girls were mostly taken as domestic help or forced labor, bearing children, begging, and prostitution. Children aged between 11 to 16. Uh, those who were lucky landed as domestic help, but many of them, unlucky ones, were sold as uh, for marriage and prostitution. One thing that was stark between the two geographies that we studied was the extent to which trafficking differed in, in slow onset event area compared to uh, rapid onset event. For example, in Palamo, the, 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 the extent of traffic migrants was 42% compared to 16% in Kendra Pada. Like Manuel mentioned, they like. But climate impacts don't occur in isolation. Uh, and when they push migration, it doesn't occur in isolation. There are a lot of development deficits. There could be other factors, for example, social drivers, political drivers, demographic, economic drivers. And then along with all these factors, climate acts as a stress multiplier. And this figure that you see is it's for Palamo, where you know social protection and the other infrastructure that you have play a very important role uh, in that context. This is the second. I'm not going to go into too much detail. If you have interest, I can take some questions around it. But this, you can see the, the, the difference is uh, between the extent of trafficking in the two areas is because there are certain positive factors in Kendra Pada compared to that in Palamo. Now, Manuel did uh, mention that, you know, it's, it's wrong to say that there, there is not going to be this more of internal displacement and not too much of cross border uh, uh, migration. But you know, I you know, while I say that to some extent, the right now the evidence that we have out there, like uh, dependable evidence, does say that internal displacement is happening. But we have we have started collecting. Uh, that's why I said a lot of lot of data or evidence around what loss and damage is really creating is not out there, and that's why we need to collect more of bottom up evidence. And that's why we you know most of our evidence are not done by the global north. It is more done by the by the edit or by the authors of the Global South, and this this trend of cross border migration is also very starkly coming out in many of those. Why and why this issue is important to address now uh, is because it's you know it's issue of scale and also because of time. We are seeing that there yeah, some amount of uh, global warming is already locked in, and the impact of that we are seeing in terms of these unprecedented events events of biblical proportion, like things that you just cannot adapt to. What would happen? For example, Manuel mentioned about cyclone shelters in Bangladesh. Yes, there are very good cyclone early warning system. People's lives are saved. But when, but when they go back, and we had a had lot of discussion with communities from Bangladesh, when they go back, their land is completely destroyed. It's covered with salt, it's salination, and they can never go back to their original life. 
So even if you've saved their life, you have taken them back, they again force for migration because their livelihood has to completely shift because the agricultural land is destroyed forever. So even like you can say it's not a direct consequence, but it is a, a direct, like indirectly, that climate is behind uh, a lot of these factors that is happening. And unfortunately, a lot of evidence that has come out, you look at ground soil report of uh, World Bank, which only covers the internally displaced, it says 260 million uh, migrants would be created by internally, the IDPs would be created by 2050. You know, and again, if you look at the regions, one of the regions most affected would be Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and those regions, regions which are extremely, already extremely poor. So what do we really need to do? We first need to recognize the international recognition of this issue is needed. We do have Sendai framework, we do have a task force for displacement within UFCCC, mm -hmm. but then fail to recognize that when we do not provide social safety people, because when people don't have protection, uh, for basic shelter, for basic health, uh, for food, they are then pushed into pursuing risky migration opportunities, risky coping, and they land on the dark side of these migratory flows, which can lead to, which leads to uh, uh, the slavery and trafficking. I was really, like la yesterday, the report from ILO came out, which said in the last five years itself, the slavery percentage, people in modern slavery has increased by 10 million, which is not a small number. It used to be 40.3 million, now it's around 50 million. But, and we, they have identified climate change as a factor within that. So we really need to, how do we protect these people who, especially if you look at Pakistan floods, people who are out there living in, uh, in these refugee camps, how do you protect them so that they don't get, they, because they know when they go back their house and land and everything will be destroyed. How do they dwell back better? You look at Germany, Germany had similar scale of flood last year. They not just build back; they build back better. You can't expect the other countries to do that. They don't have they don't have the resources. They don't have the infrastructure and the wherewithal to build back. Not build, building back better is simply out of the uh, window for them. So we do need rights based social safety net and an anticipatory action. And climate finance is something that should be paying for this. Uh, and thirdly, I would say national recognition. Because even if you look at many of these countries, which are seeing a lot of internal displacement, very rarely you see migration being mentioned in their NDCs, in their climate policies, or let alone their development policy. So this is something that needs to be covered there. Um, I know I haven't done justice uh, with the kind of data and uh, trends that I've shared, but I'm providing uh, some of the links to some of the papers and the, uh, and the evidence that I just presented. So you'll really look, look at it in more detail there. Thank you so much, Ritu. Thank you for highlighting those important social impacts and, and for providing some policy solutions as well. Um, next up, we have Liz Russell, who will be speaking at the most uh, local scale about some on the ground experiences working with communities in Louisiana and the Mississippi River Delta. Over to you, Liz. Thanks, Lucien, and thank you both, uh, Ritu and Manuel, for your presentations. Um, I want to acknowledge at the start of this presentation that um, you know, I'm working in Louisiana and part of the US, um, and we are one of those places that have resources to begin to respond. And even still, we're dealing with a lot of challenges here uh, on how to institutionalize any of those preparations or responses. And But I just want to acknowledge the privilege and the resources that um, are in the project that I'm, in about, I'm about to talk about. Um, so I want to give a little bit of a sort of history of, of how we got here in Louisiana. Um, so uh, in New Orleans and Southeast Louisiana, you'll see sort of we are at the intersection of multiple European colonization, uh, uh, French, Spanish and, and the British Empire, in addition to indigenous uh, tribal governments um, and, in, and in addition to uh, slavery and the importation of African people into uh, into what became the United States. I also want to acknowledge that we are uh, at 41% uh, of the US drains into southern Louisiana. And so we deal with climate crises from sort of multiple directions, both from the flooding of the Mississippi River system, which is the distributaries and tributaries that you see in pink, um, but also from coastal land loss and coastal inundation. Uh, and so we see that on multiple fronts. Um, 
Southern Louisiana has a history of being extremely dynamic um, and, and fluctuating and the river building land looking for the shortest, fastest route to the Gulf of Mexico. And indigenous peoples had no challenges sort of navigating uh, this dyna dynamism of the landscape. Uh, but since European colonization and, and throughout the evolution of the US, we have seen that river managed and levied uh, to prevent flooding and allow for growth of communities and economies. Um, the development uh, originally was on the high ground in those areas that were less susceptible to water and flooding, um, and then it expanded into wetlands and, and towards the open water with different engineering practices. We also see an overlay of racialized real estate valuation, um, where resources have been prioritized into mostly white communities throughout time. Uh, so these areas that you see in red are from the practice of redlining that was common across the US um, uh, up until uh, the late 1960s, but still exists in terms of uh, of real estate valuation practices, even even uh, more covert, I guess, than it used to be. Um, Hurricane Katrina, I just want to mention, and obviously I'm not here to talk about Katrina, but I want to mention that most of the areas that flooded with extreme depths uh, were areas that uh, had been developed out and, and sort of filled in the wetlands. Um, and as development expanded, and as those cities sort of encroached upon uh, the wetland ecosystems, those are the areas that are most vulnerable to uh, the inland flooding. So we have this history of, of the distributary system building land and then uh, uh, with the management of the Mississippi River system and the pervasiveness of oil and gas infrastructure and maritime commerce that crisscrossed uh, the wetland ecosystem, uh, we see a future where sea level rise um, is ongoing, um, obviously, and, and where coastal land loss is ongoing, and communities are increasingly subject to the impacts of that. Um, we uh, have made tremendous investments in coastal restoration and working to reclaim some of those wetland losses from the seas. Um, and, and I just want to indicate the maps that I'm going to be showing are these same maps. They're just uh, in different colors. This is a 50 year, $50 billion uh, set of engineering projects. But I want to underscore that even with these types of adaptation measures and the measures to reduce coastal land loss and increase coastal restoration, it's not enough to uh, address the scale of um, ongoing migration due to acute and chronic stressors, both from um, what we call hurricanes, but cyclones, and, and also from the chronic land loss that is ongoing on a daily basis. Um, in the US, we also have a sort of reactive set of policies that respond to the previous storm events. Um, and so if you look across this timeline, you can see that we've had significant storm events that have cost the nation um, billions of dollars. And then we react to that by trying to um, layer on new policies to fix it. But uh, it's, it's a sort of set of layers of bureaucracy that are really challenging over the layers of complexity in the landscape. Um, so even with $50 billion in the coastal master plan, I just want to illustrate that without action, right, we see a tremendous amount of land loss, but even with land, uh, even with that $50 billion investment, we still see uh, tremendous land loss and, and beyond a smaller footprint than is currently uh, the shape of Louisiana. We also see more projected flooding. So the deeper blues here are higher waters. Um, this is where we are now. This is with no action. You see a lot of nine to 12 feet. So definitely above that chest threshold. Um, and with the coastal master plan, you see a lot less of those deep, darker blues, but you still see extreme flooding by 2067, even with $50 billion of investment in coastal restoration. Um, and so re in reaction to this, um, I want to acknowledge that people in Louisiana are already moving. So um, since 2005, we've had hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, Isaac, the BP oil spill. Uh, two heavy rainfall events in 2016, Laura, Delta, Zeta, and Ida, um, meaning that every person in Louisiana has uh, lost power, has uh, had their been subjected to flooding or they already know uh, or subjected to flooding many times. Um, and so again, uh, to Manuel's point, people with resources are already picking up and moving. And so we have a spectrum of, of sort of conditions in Louisiana where we see sort of those being forced to think about resettling and, and relocating and those uh, areas that are growing in population and trying to accommodate the areas that are, are, are shifting. Um, so excuse me, we see shifts in revenue and social services and 
um, and I'll tie into this a little bit. Basically, as people are moving, um, their shifts in local tax bases, they're un, uh, unable to maintain social services. Um, so uh, any of the social safety nets that do exist in those local areas that are funded by the local governments, um, seeing those shifts in population also means a shifts in tax bases. Um, and so you're unable to maintain your police services or your fire services, um, maintain access to health care in many cases. Um, in, in parts of southern Louisiana, you have to drive almost an hour to get to an area with um, with fresh produce. Um, and then on the reverse of that, where people are moving to, you see development expanding again into those more, more vulnerable wetland areas and into the areas that we expect to lose land, even with full invest investment in the coastal master plan. Um, but the critical problem is that we're not actually uh, designing our development practices to accommodate water and accommodate a growth in people and being really thoughtful about where we should be developing and where we should be prohibiting development so that we don't get in this same crisis as, uh, as the sh seas continue to shift inland and surpass the areas that are already losing land um, and get to those areas that are currently receiving communities. Um, so as we deal with this, I want to begin to talk about a project that I led um, about five years ago now um, in my previous role as the Climate Justice Program Officer. Um, these challenges are not only environmental, as both other previous speakers have, have, have mentioned. These are challenges of economics, of access to services, of healthcare, of housing, um, and, and of your being able to transport yourself to work. Um, and so we began to think about that as all of those facets, and, and we worked to try to engage the people most impacted at the start of this. Um, uh, we designed a program called Lead the Coast that was a development program for residents and coastal leaders, um, again, in my previous capacity at the Foundation for Louisiana. Um, and this is a program to really connect people who identify as leaders, but maybe don't identify as coastal or climate or environmental leaders, and give them the tools to actually lead their communities and advocate for what they need in terms of design and decision making processes that actually respond to these uh, coastal and climate changes. Um, so this program um, allows people to connect their personal experience to the pathways for decision making and engagement with government. Um, the Foundation for Louisiana has run this program seven or eight times now, ran a virtual program during the pandemic, and a lot of those leaders who came through the program have gone on to engage in many of the government processes that are trying to work to plan for climate migration and adaptation. Um, but the LA safe process is really what I want to talk about very briefly and, and the community and stakeholder vision being built out and supported combined with best planning practices and an understanding of those current and future environmental scenarios. Over the course of 2017, we had five rounds of meetings um, across the whole Southeast Louisiana six parish region, more than 70 public meetings over a 10 month process. Um, again, to really work with the residents who were dealing with the most extreme impacts of these disasters and plan out what types of public investment, what types of policies, projects, and programs would actually be useful in beginning to address these needs. Um, so across these meetings, there were uh, the residents from all over the coast that were engaged. Um, and we provided resources to childcare, to transportation. We made sure that there was food at every meeting. Um, and then we also provided stipends for Lead the Coast graduates to actually be the facilitators or the table hosts of the public meetings so that residents weren't having these conversations only with government officials, but instead with their neighbors or their friends or their family or their colleagues who had taken the leadership opportunity to really engage and, and hold the space for them. Um, across these meetings, we talked about low, moderate, and high flood risk, um, and we tried to talk about managing water in addition to housing and development, transportation, economy and jobs, education, and then culture and recreation as well. We also bounced across multiple scales, but the last thing I, I, I want to point to is the way that we talked about the time scale, um, because 10 years from now, 25 years from now, and 50 years from now, coastal Louisiana looks very different, um, and more and more people are faced with the decision about whether to relocate, Okay, 
how to relocate, what pathways that they could do to use to do so, or how they could stay in place. I loved uh, Manuel's vocabulary of the ability to move, or they're on the move, or they're going to be able to stay, because that is very much consistent with what we're seeing in Louisiana. Um, but we use this time scale question to really back into those challenging conversations, um, because people started to respond, look, I'm never going to move. I'm never leaving. But my children, they've already left. They went to find a better life for my grandchildren children. Um, and again, with, with what Manuel said, um, there, what we're seeing is localized regional migration. So people are not picking up and moving to the northern part of the state even. They're picking up and moving to one or two towns north uh, along those, uh, those fingers of the highways and the bayous that are higher land and less susceptible to flooding. Um, but thinking about this in terms of those timescales and how to access your children, your grandchildren, the generations that are going to come after you was really the way for us to start to get to the projects, programs, and policies policies <coughs> and, and not having a really uh, extreme public backlash. Um, Residents and community members work to identify challenges, strengths, and opportunities across these parishes. This looked different in the different parishes because every parish has some uh, proportion of, of low flood risk, moderate flood risk, and high flood risk. All the parishes had all three, um, but some parishes had a lot more high flood risk. Some parishes had a lot more low flood risk. So some were planning more to be receiving communities. Uh, some were planning more to lose their entire population base. Um, and so in these uh, conversations, we essentially started to pull together a crowdsourced land use map. Um, so people's ideas were drawn on maps on tables across these meetings, and then we worked with design firms to uh, get those into shared documents. So we essentially um, were every meeting we were coming back to residents and sort of showing them what they had told us uh, so that we could see and sort of reiterate um, that their ideas were really uh, uh, coming back into what was being planned by the government. Um, it wasn't something that they just voiced an opinion and then they never saw it again. Uh, it was really important that, that people really saw themselves in the planning process. Um, uh, we also overlaid that with existing municipal planning. So where uh, government was planning for local drainage or expansion of a highway uh, or uh, schools were being shut down because of local tax bases, we tried to overlay what was happening in those municipalities with what the residents were actually asking for. Um, the critical part here is that there are never going to be enough resources, even in the countries that, that have um, already made commitments and, and have the privilege to be able to commit resources to these actions. They're never going to be resources for everything. And so how do you leverage investments so that they produce multiple um, benefits? And that's that's really the, the place we tried to come from. So there were six projects that uh, were proposed for each of these parishes. And you see across these different types of projects, they're very different, right? One is a seafood market. So to support the fishing communities that uh, come back uh, to these ports um, and call this parish home. Other stormwater management a business incubator to help support, again, uh, to, to uh, me to point, uh, Rita's point that, uh, uh, that the economies are changing. And so how do you diversify and how do you know that when the person comes back to their house after the next storm event, the economy is going to look different? Um, anecdotally, we hear over and over again, by the time I came back, my employer had found another, another employee and was bringing someone in from Texas the next state over. Um, so how do you actually invest in uh, economies as a as a government that can accommodate the sort of ongoing shift and fluctuation and support those local businesses who would hire local people? Um, across the six parishes, uh, each of the six projects, we actually uh, put it forward in the final round of meetings so that residents actually voted on what projects they wanted to see funding. Um, so everyone who came to the final round of meetings was given color coded tokens um, and the tubes that we had were wrapped and at the end of the meeting we unwrapped them and everyone in the meeting got to see uh, where their neighbors uh, and, and other folks at the meeting had prioritized project investment. Um, 
So what you actually see in the final 10 projects that were selected for investment, um, there was $40 million put out by the state of Louisiana at the start of this that was actually out of a national um, competition for ad climate adaptation funding and resilience funding. Um, the state actually moved forward in investing in the projects that were voted on by the people who participated in this process. And so you had average residents really informing what was $40 million of investment. Um, and you can see across the different project types, they're very variable, right? Mental health care, expansion of resources for mental health care next to an incubator, next to stormwater management, and also uh, uh, buyouts for residents who were looking to relocate from an area that was extremely vulnerable and outside of levy protection. Um, we also move forward to create six uh, regional plans. So one for each county, each parish, and, and one for a regional document. Um, so there's policies, programs, and policy recommendations in that. Um, and, and then we also included sort of land use around planning on the high grounds, those areas that we expect to remain high and dry and poised to continue to receive uh, people and, and grow and swell um, and, and do well in the face of climate change, at least for the next uh, 50 years plus. Um, but then also, what does it look like in areas uh, that are losing population? And so how do we understand the sort of tension between the areas losing population and gaining population, even as part of one region? Um, now, individual parish governments are moving forward uh, to draft ordinances so that some of these policies can actually be adopted uh, because this was a one off investment. Um, the heavy rainfall events in 2017 meant that we had federal dollars allocated after that flood. We had 26 inches of rain um, in, in about 24 hours, um, meaning that 54 parishes in Louisiana had extreme flooding. Um, and so now how do we leverage some of the lessons we learned from LA safe into that ongoing work, excuse me. Um, we're also where there's investment in coastal restoration so that 50 year $50 billion plan, how do we make sure that those investments create jobs for local people and people that are most subject to the impacts of coastal land laws and are already being forced to consider relocation and and again how do we diversify and expand that economy uh, to actually support the needs of the people of Louisiana in the face of disaster whether that is the individual hurricanes or the ongoing land loss and sea level rise uh, the state of Louisiana is also taking on efforts to try to get to net zero, um, and, and we've come up with a plan for how to do so. Um, uh, so all of that said, I, I, I know I've, I've shared quite a lot quite quickly, but um, please go to these two websites to learn more uh, if you'd like to, and, and I can be reached at the email uh, here. Thank you so much, Liz, for providing that kind of concrete example of, of the pathways to um, relocation and, and um, it was really useful uh, to provide kind of an, a, a clear example from one location. Um, we have about 35 minutes left. So we're gonna go into our question and answer uh, portion of, of the event um, and have a bit of a dialogue. As a reminder, please type any questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, and we will be pulling some questions from there. Uh, to start us off, I wanted to, you know, all three speakers um, address the complexity of migration and, and Manuel said um, that climate migration is, is almost always multi-causal, meaning that it's, it's happening because of a multitude of factors. Um, for example, a, a drought might force people to move not only from crop failure, but also from resulting economic, political, or social conflict. Um, so I guess my question, and, and maybe I'll direct this to Manuel first, um, but welcome anybody's opinion, um, is, is it important to distinguish specifically climate migrants from other migrants and, and why or why not? And can we create programs or policies um, to address the, the issues if they're just lumped together with all migrants? Um, or are there opportunities to create kind of more specific and tailored policies um, or protection, social protections if we do distinguish specifically climate migrants? Thank you. Um... <laughs> It's a tough question. Uh, well, has a simple answer, <laughs> which is no, but is uh, it has a complex explanation um, from our perspective, and I will try to, to focus on that. The challenges of migration by climate or the challenges of migration by 
livelihood opportunities, they are not very different. People need information. They need safe pathways to have that mobility. And the assurance is that that movement is safe and they are protected from the moment they depart to the moment that they arrive and they are integrated. And this applies to any kind of mobility excluding and characterizing the key precursor of mobility it's interesting it helps us understand or or <laughs> frame a bit better the complexity in, in a more digestible way but it doesn't change if it's for economical reasons if it's for climate if we dig in uh, into economical reasons, we will start looking at the history of the areas of origin of these issues, um, instances of social inequality, instances of exploitation. We will have relations with colonialism or other forms of conflict and sharing of resources or religion. It's the same when we go and dig up for climate and the issues of climate justice and why people in vulnerable climate countries that have not created pollution are now the ones most affected because they have less capacity. I usually use an example, which is a complicated example because it's not climate, is with earthquakes, right? An earthquake in the desert is not a disaster. An earthquake in the US or in Japan or in, let's say, the periphery of the Philippines or, or Pakistan. It's a problem. The governments have two different capacities. Society have two different capacities. And the same intensity can have devastating impacts in the most vulnerable. And so if we try to block these different forms of mobility, we will be looking in solutions for each of these typologies. And what we need is to continue and incentivize the global compact on migration, objective five, safer pathways for people to move, irrespectively of the, um, the trigger that will move, what we in objective to call the adverse drivers of migration. And climate is one of the factors, one of the drivers that will add to others. Some people may move because they all their cattle died, right? Their cattle died because there's a bad uh, distribution of resources because it didn't rain. But they will move because the cattle died. They don't have a way to do money. Is this climate? Is this an economical differentiation? And I think if we enter in this segregation, we are doing a disservice for these communities. Everyone wants an opportunity to raise their children. People preferentially want to stay where they are and have opportunities in their life. And if they have to move, and if they choose to move, which is the most important thing, they should do so in a safe way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, just wanted to give an opportunity if either Liz or Ritu would want to comment on this question at all. Yeah, I agree with Manuel and very nice uh, way of presenting it. Uh, uh, and yes, climate does act as a stress multiplier. But I, well, I would like to correct uh, or, or add to what Manuel said. It's not just one of the factors. It's a factor which is exacerbating almost all the factors. So, you know, it increases economic risk, it increases social marginalization, it, in, it erodes the institutions and so on. And that has a stress. So your, your example about cattle dying, in fact, cattle, you know, you never know whether the, the health of the cattle are, in, are, are de decreasing because of the climatic factors, because of vector borne diseases. You know, they are, and that's why we are focusing so much on bottom of evidence. We really need to understand because there's so many things about climate impact that we don't know. We take, we look at modeling projections. We try to then try to overlay some of these modeling projections with some of the trends occurring. But you actually look at the ground. For example, one of the Kendrapara, the coastal areas in Orissa that we saw, you know, 4,000 houses were moved. 1,600 households are already moved from the second location. And you will not imagine there's a bus service uh, which runs from Kendrapara, which is in the middle of the of that country to right up to uh, Kerala, which is like more than thousand kilometers away, a bus service, a weekly bus service. And that is because of the quantum of uh, the migrants, which has, so it's, it's more about, you know, where do people move in despair? One, they do they move with like the supply and demand. If you look at the economics of all of it, the supply and demand of migrants have increased. So their bargaining power in this whole informal labor market where they actually land up is, is, is gets weakened. And two, 
whenever climate impacts happen, it's not they just can't like what Liz was mentioning. They just can't return back to their original format. They need like because the land is sandcasted, it's salinated. They can't practice agriculture. They need a change in the skills. And what they know is only to practice ag. Probably they know fishing, they know agriculture. So then there's a need for livelihood shifts. And for that, they need new skills. Uh, and there was a question that was posed uh, here. And I'm because it's from Alex Bambusa, uh, Basum uh, Mabu, uh, who mentioned whether pastoralists can be termed as climate migrants. Uh, in fact, if you look at one of the case studies with that we did for Turkana County in Kenya, pastoralists actually are now being forced because of the lack of, uh, because pastoralists are the best, have the best coping mechanism. They move their herd, they have a diversity of uh, uh, livestock, and therefore they're able to minimize the impact of climate on, their, on, on themselves. But even now they're not able to cope with those traditional coping mechanisms. And many of these pastoralists are now leaving their, uh, their, their original traditional uh, livelihood and they're moving to urban centers and that is creating stress on them. Um, so yeah, I'll just stop there and let Liz or anyone else respond to that. No, I, I think I agree with everything that Manuel and Ritu have said. I, um, I would just, I, I would add one more anecdote where we see um, when fishermen lose their boats because of a, a, a disaster, right? Uh, it's one inability to respond and they're not able to get back on the water to begin pulling in more fish to get money for their family. Um, and at the same time, when you see sea level rise, you also see saltwater intrusion and movement of the saltwater into different areas, changing the ecosystem and the different fisheries that um, that are in one place. So I'm, I just mentioned that anecdote to say that um, there are there are complexities that overlap between the sort of shocks of uh, an individual hurricane or an individual flood um, and the ongoing uh, sort of chronic stressor uh, of the coastal sea level rise. Um, and the way that those manifest are economic challenges in families um, and an inability to be able to, to just provide for your family in the industry that you've maybe known for generations, but it, it's not something that's completely separate from, from the rest of your, your, other, your other life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions sort of still on this theme of, of how we're defining climate migration and, and whether or not these definitions open up services or do a disservice um, to who they're affecting. And, and there's a question from a journalist um, based in Jakarta who is asking if the relocation of the capital city that the government has been planning for, for many years um, due to worsening flooding problems and overpopulation, if something like that is considered climate migration as well. I'm not sure if anyone would like to comment on specifically Jakarta. I, I can I can comment. Thank you, Manuel. It, it it could constitute de facto a climate mobility as a permanent relocation. Jakarta uh, not only floods, but it sinks down and has been sinking for several centuries, is very comparable. Well, it can be to Mexico City, the water is extracted, sinks down again because the volume of water is removed. Jakarta suffers from this and then there is a drainage. So I think so. And these permanent relocations uh, are significant. We see examples in Mozambique, in coastal areas uh, around the world and in islands on the Pacific where the intrusion of sea level of water in the sea water, in the water availability makes the water bracket so people cannot leave. It erodes infrastructures, it destroys livelihoods. And so it's important to move. And, and in this movement, when planned, this movement when done in conjunctions with the communities and respecting the communities and also respecting the areas where people go is very positive. We should not throw away the dozens of years of experience that the world has on large infrastructures. When in the 70s, in the 80s, and in the 90s, and even today, large infrastructures like dams, roads, big factories, big ports, people have been moved away 
to do that infrastructure. We need to bring back that knowledge, all the, the perspective of human rights and dignity of individuals affected to allow this new approach of a, a permanent move to a safer area. We just need to be careful that this move is not consecutive over time because we are not working on mitigation and actually changing the trajectory of emissions, right? That needs to be capped. Then we need to have better practices and there will be a group of people that de facto will have to move. And history has thousands of examples of cities that move by cyclones, by volcanoes, you know. <laughs> we are just losing the practice of understanding this phenomena and, and, and these impacts and adapting to them. I think that... that... Sure, thank you, thank you. Did you want yes, to add adding to what Manuel said, it's not just a story about Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, like two thirds of uh, cities are in the coastal areas, and they would be exposed. Like, and and we already seeing the impact of 1.3, 1.4 degree rise, uh, and this will be even more higher because the kind of pledges that countries have made in their NDCs, um, it's clearly it's going to take. Uh, as to 2.7 degrees by the end of century, unless net zero, which would eventually take us to 2.2, but most of the countries are pushing it, uh, pushing action on it by uh, only after 2030, which means we are going on a more warming trajectory and more of these uh, incidences like the ones that we've seen in Pakistan or Bangladesh or others, it would increase more. And many of these coastal cities would be exposed um, like we're saying, even in these rural areas, many of these, like you see in rural child, like every household has got displaced three to seven times. So it shouldn't be like one displacement and second and the third and the fourth. So how do we make sure that displacement is once and then they're able to resettle and settle down in their lives? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, Ritu, I wanted to follow up with some, something you had on your list of you know, um, solutions was international recognition. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, in thinking about these definitions and, and how we're defining it, if um, expanded protections for refugees um, related to climate is something you see as important. Uh, you know, there are, there are international protections for things like religious persecution, um, but not necessarily for environmental um, issues. And, um, there are a couple of questions here about, you know, there's someone from um, a coastal part of India where the government is not considering climate migration, um, though people are, are moving uh, frequently due to sea erosion. And, and how can we get the government to address this and recognize it? Um, there's also, uh, you know, there was a question from um, someone in Egypt who was worried about some of the um, issues of violence and crime stemming from this. So are there international bodies that can step in and regulate and oversee some of this, the crime, the slavery that you, you mentioned are sort of cascading effects. Um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts on sort of this international recognition and what that would look like. So yes, uh, one is, it's not like people, communities or uh, international bodies are not working on migration. There are, there are a number of Sendai framework, you see task force on displacement within EFCCC, but they're working too much in silos. Like everyone is looking at migration from a different perspective. Probably we need a more joined up approach uh, because we're clearly seeing like a lot of these issues, they interject with each other. And we need to find a more, uh, like a more holistic solution to this. Now coming to the national level, uh, I don't know whether you looked at the figures from Palamu area, a spawn set event area and the rapid onset event area. Clearly the, 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 the percentage of migrants who were trafficked was higher in the slow onset event area. And that's just one aspect of it. And if you dig deeper into it, it's like, you know, I'll also, because there's so many journalists uh, online here, I would like to mention typically, how many times do you really see uh, an article around slow onset event? You see, uh, media buzzing with, oh, there was a flood here, there was a cyclone here, there was a heat wave here. Slow onset event is something that slips from everyone's agenda. And because quite often media has a very important role. So quite often media doesn't cover it because it doesn't, it's not sensational enough. It does not create that pressure on the policymakers. And if I typically take the example of India, we have cyclone early warning system, very good. We have flood early warning system in, in the development but no drought early warning system, which means that political will or political pressure to do something about it is not there. Unless you inform people in advance that there is an, a drought or drought-like situation settling, setting in, 
you they can't be prepared. Second is around coping. For coping, people need social safety net. All three speakers on the panelists mentioned that. They need a safety net to feel protected, whether they are wherever they are, whether they're a trapped population, they can't move. They need, where if they are trapped, they need basic shelter, at least access to subsidized food, healthcare, and so on, people who are vulnerable. Then people, and the typical problem with many of these programs, the way the social safety net are designed, they remain with them as long as they are in the native village. They don't move with them. So those social safety net are not portable. So if I take the example of India again, you are entitled to uh, like job guarantees as long as you are in the village. There's 100 days of job guarantee available. But the moment you move, you're forced to move, you don't carry those entitlements with you. So that's why it has to be more rights-based, whether I'm, even if we consider just the internal uh, displacement. But if you're moving within the country, the moment you're leaving one state to another state, or one city to another city, you're not covered by any social protection. You're left to fend on yourself. And typically these people, they land on the margins of the cities. They land in informal settlements. They land job in informal labor market where they have absolutely, they can't even, they can't even demand like how much is, am I going to be paid in wages for the whole day? So many of these labor market regulations, they don't cover them. So, you know, so that social safety net can only occur if there is a recognition within the policymakers, both at the national and at the international level. And quite often we miss that, you know, there has to be a linkage between social protection programs or social assistance or social assurance program and informal labor market reforms. So they have to be combined together. Only then we can protect many of these migrants. And, and one thing more that I want to mention, these migrants or displacement, the word displacement, it means they're displacing forever. Many of these are seasonal in nature. They go, they come back. It's cyclical, it's seasonal because they want to go back, earn, go back and try to, because that's the only skill they're available to them. They only know agriculture or fishing. So they want to earn, go back next, try to crop the next uh, crop in the next season. If it, it fails again, they again incur debt, they again go back. So you have to make sure that your cities are, like they are equipped to handle these migratory flows. Uh, and many of these migrants have the skill when they move to another area, they have the skill to get employed in, in, a, in not in informal settlements, informal labor market, but in a proper skilled job. I see Liz's hands up, so I'll just uh, hand it over to her. Uh, so, so I just wanted to, I, I agree with what Rinto is saying, and I just wanted to underscore the need for every single government entity at multiple levels of government to be understanding migration and, and climate change as part of their everyday job. And that's very hard because all of our government entities are typically quite under-resourced and most of the staff are, are just trying to be able to do their daily jobs and not, not add something extremely complex that they may not have a sophisticated analysis on. Um, but it's not separate, right? Uh, it, it's something that has to be included in every uh, facet of, of any type of public investment, um, in, in my opinion. So when, uh, when you're thinking about education and access to schooling when you're thinking about economy and and job access when you're thinking about public health care services but also i mean we've seen increases uh, and and changes to the needs of the criminal justice system um in, in the context of ongoing uh crises from repeated disaster events um and, and so again like each of those government entities at a local or state level is not prepared to be thinking about ongoing migration, um, but some of those these questions have to be considered and institutionalized so that they're understanding the linkages and immediately sort of beginning to to think about how programs that they already have in some cases uh, could be supplemented uh, uh, with with ways to actually address these crises. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, move on to another question, which is um, about how public perception and media attention differ for slow versus rapid onset climate impacts. You know how uh, media attention might be there for something like a large scale disaster, um, but for sort of more slow um, impacts, like you know the incremental uh, sea level rise, uh, it's harder to get media attention and harder for journalists to get uh, you know to produce stories about these. Um, so my question is sort of how can we highlight not only the major disasters 
um, but some of these steady impacts too. Uh, we have a, a question uh, in the Q&A from uh, a journalist in, in Kenya talking about sort of the, this annual um, issue of, of drought and hunger and how can, um, how can they sort of report on this as cases continue to rise. Um, it's open to anyone, if anyone, Richie, would you like to? Yes, in? I'll just start off and I'll request others to join in. Uh, firstly, the slow and sudden onset. It's something which I have been struggling for a very long time. Um, because in many ways, I keep saying this, slow onset disaster almost acts like a slow poison for the community because it doesn't get, like I said, media has an important role. That, that immediate political pressure on the policymakers or the governments is not there. It's not reported. It's not creating panic. It's somewhere happening. And people are struggling and to cope with it. And quite often, and, and that's the reason why in Palamu, the place where, where I said almost two and a half times higher than the flood and cyclone affected area, because they have like people, uh, you know, typically we say in India, we have a very good uh, food security program. But in those areas, people were actually suffering from hunger. They didn't have, like they had less than one spare meals a day. And obviously I would underscore what Manuel and Liz have said, it's that hunger is not just because of climate, but climate is a very important factor to it. They, because it's like, you know, if there's a one season of crop loss, they incur a debt, they lose their land because they took a debt and the landlord has taken their land away. And I'll just typically give you an example of Palamu area. I myself went to that area. They were, you know, even the landlord, which, is, which had taken away the land of these small and marginal farmers because of this recurring debt. If every time they lost a crop they, and they couldn't repay, then they couldn't repay, so it was all taken away. But even for those landlords, the land was of no use because there's land, severe water scarcity. And they were, we counted, like there were 17 brick kilns in the vicinity. And you know, the moment you enter, the microclimate changes. You enter into the village, microclimate changes because there's so much of heat out there. And girls as young as 14, 15, they were working in those brick kilns. You walk there, you'll feel your shoe melting. It's so hot. Obviously, it that again, brick kiln operation needs water. So whatever they they're using massive uh, uh, irrigation infrastructure to bring water to those brick kilns, and that's creating more scarcity. So it's like a vicious cycle, a lot of things. There's a social structure which has underprivileged people who have been there. There is a, like a, institutions are weak. They don't get representation in those in institutions where they could oppose such victims uh, being set up. And then there's rampant child uh, trafficking in that area. Young girls are being trafficked. So how do you stop it? Climate is at the, like that's one additional layer this issue was there, but it wasn't to that scale. Now that, you know, with the increasing intensity of climate, that intensity of that issue is also increasing. So somehow media has to look at it. I myself went and talked to one of the policymakers in India. He said, oh, where is sea level rise? And in India, it's not happening. It's happening in Indonesia. So the thing is, because it's not highlighted, I showed him the example of what's happening in Kendrapada, seven villages already underwater, and I'm sure there are other parts in India where it is happening too, but it's just because it's not being highlighted, doesn't come out. But for media people, especially uh, from the journalists uh, that I see from Turkana County, uh, you know, typically, especially for Kenya and that area where they were pastoralists, and they, were, they had a very good coping mechanism, even with water stress, they were able to keep rotating, finding pastures for their livestock, had a very mix of livestock. And now they're forced to come and stay in urban settlements, have a fixed lifestyle, and that is creating, they're all moving to alcoholism. There is too much of gender violence within their families. They, and even in Lake Chad Basin, the other case study we did, people, because they are losing livelihood, that the natural resource-based livelihood, they are left more vulnerable to being radicalized by many of these extremist ideologies. So what typically media people have to do, they have to understand those overlaying issues and then combine them to understand how climate is really impacting or creating vulnerability, the compounding impact of climate change, uh, how climate is compounding the other impacts that they're already facing. Thank you. 
Um, yes, I wanted to uh, address a question and, and maybe to, to Liz first, since you've worked kind of directly with communities and planning and designing solutions is, is um, this topic of, of language and the terms that are um, new to trying to find this issue and how we are and aren't calling things. You know, I'm thinking specifically of the term managed retreat to me always sounds like so academic and, and would be hard to speak to people on the ground about, you know, leaving their home by using the term managed retreat. Um, and I like in your presentation, you talked about um, addressing this as maybe your children or grandchildren might move, even if you're not going to. And so I'm just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about language and terminology and, and sort of what that looks like in communicating with communities that this is impacting. Yeah, thanks so much, Lucian. I, I would say the, the language that we use throughout the many public meetings in 2017 was incredibly important. Um, and, and as many folks know, climate change is, is language that has been extremely politicized in the US um, and, and many other places, but very much here. Um, at that point in time, um, and, and we've actually seen polling and, and research and focus groups that, that say that many more Louisianans are now at a point where that term is not as politicized. Um, but folks, we didn't go into communities and talk about climate change. We went in and talked about uh, the exact impacts from climate change that they were seeing in that area. Um, whether or not that was sort of sea level rise and land loss or extreme weather and what that looked like. Um, heavy rainfall based on uh, just storms uh, lasting uh, and providing more rain in shorter periods of time and combining that with development patterns. Um, in terms of managed retreat specifically, um, most folks locally, I've, I haven't met anybody locally that doesn't find it actually an offensive term. Um, and and uh, people, people, I think are more inclined to talk about it openly if they connect it to their own past experience. So one of the colleagues that I work closely with down the bayou, he's like, look like we moved here because we got kicked out of this other community um, uh, as our, our previous generations sort of moved into another area. We're used to migrating. Um, we are used to moving, we're used to picking up um, and we have to keep our cultural traditions and sort of tie that to wherever we're going um, and wherever we've been. Um, and, and he doesn't talk about retreat, but he talks about the fact that his parents moved one one town up from their grand, his grandparents. Uh, and he talks about the fact that he and his partner and their child now live one town up from where his parents live. Um, because the sort of the land loss that is chronic and ongoing has demanded it. I don't think he would ever call it managed retreat. Um, but he is a sort of example of 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 a family who has over generations made the decisions to go places where they feel like they can be safer and be able to thrive and be able to maintain those cultural traditions. Um, and so I, I think it's extremely challenging, but I think for me, that's one area where it's always clear when somebody from outside has parachuted into a community um, because they're using language that doesn't resonate with anyone from there. Um, and I think that was a really important part of the LA Safe process also with the local leaders essentially going through the Lead the Coast program and then being table hosts or facilitators at the public meetings, because then it wasn't it wasn't language from outside the place or up the river or across the river or up the bayou. It was it was language of that place. Um, it was it was people from that place talking with people that they knew and trusted uh, about what they wanted to see from their community in the future. Um, and and we tried to use language that wasn't um, how do we save your community, but how could we improve your community? What would you like to see? if we all invested um, to make our communities better. And, and that's sort of how we started to work our way into the challenging conversations around needing additional mental health care support or divorce, diversifying economic access around different job opportunities. It wasn't like, how do you change your life from what it currently is, but how do we improve, how do, how do we use these investments or create investments that could actually uh, um, build a better community um, and be true to the culture of this place that you love. Yeah, thank you so much. I think language is so important, not only for working with the community, but for journalists here to, to talk about these stories and, and um, using language that will resonate with people that they will see themselves in these stories. 
Um, we have just about five minutes left. So I just, um, maybe starting with Manuel, wanted to give everyone uh, one to two minutes to just say anything else that we may have missed or address any topics that we weren't able to get to. Um, Manuel? No, thank you. I think that um, the main point I want to, two main points I want to say, one again is these concurrence of factors that are the triggers and the stressors that move people. I will for sure endorse the correction that Rito made to what I said. Climate change is de facto the most striking and the most important of these multipliers and will have an entire new dimension on moving all of these parts apart. Um, I'm may, may, maybe as a professional vice of trying to pass these two member states in a more moderate rate, but I already talked about climate justice. I think that climate change and the threats to vulnerable communities are, are very uh, significant. And the second is people prefer to stay. The, the co entire conversation we'll have in the next couple of months about financing adaptation it, it is not a, a favor. It's what our colleague Lee says is people want to do, even in one or two generations, when people have to move, there's an attachment to a cultural value, to the histories, the memories, the self-being of individuals that we cannot ignore. We fought too much in the last half century to acknowledge cultural diversity and the history and the, that human side that is cultural and life experiences. And so it's very important to explain that we shouldn't terrify, be terrified of mobility. Mobility drove mankind where we are today. We just need to manage mobility in a safe way vis-a-vis -vis climate. These horrifying numbers, people will come, uh, large waves of migrants. It's very detrimental to people's safety. We need to inform people. We have to exclude the vicious and criminal behavior of people that exploit others in trafficking and smuggling and make sure that this safe is when they are to happen, they are safe and they represent an opportunity. Humanity has learned a lot from migration. We cannot turn this inherent quality of what is to be human into something negative. And that would be a bit of my plea uh, on these conversations. People have faces. They are not just numbers. Every single asthma of the world has a story, has a family, has her own profile and personality. We shouldn't dilute that by the numbers of millions moving here, moving there. They may or not. No, no, you're talking about humans. We need to recenter our humanity. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for those words and perspective. Um, Ritu, over to you. I'll just build on what Manuel said. So uh, two things. One is people. Yes, migration has been very positive. It has contributed positively to a to a number of economies. People who migrate bring back remittances and, and all of that leads to uh, improvement in the quality of life. But at what cost? At many places, as you see, uh, especially if you look at the child trafficking, girls trafficking, uh, they do send money back, but that's really abhorrent. Uh, second point I would like to make, you just look at the COVID crisis, the way the Western community or the developed countries responded and the way the least developed countries responded, they, Western, or developed countries, they had the wherewithal immediately, everyone. They had the resources, they had the money, they had the bank account, they had the institutional system. Everyone got uh, the subsidy or whatever support from the government immediately in their bank account. Look at any of these uh, least developed countries. One, they didn't have resources, they didn't have finances. Even if they wanted the social protection system was so underdeveloped, they couldn't reach out to people who were in crisis. So you can't reach people in crisis as quickly, as swiftly as you can in the developed countries. They don't have infrastructure. They don't have institutions or any other capacity. So when, while like mobility is good, but then managing or making these mobility patterns more dignified, providing safe migration pathway comes with resources. And that's what the least developed countries or many of these countries, they do not have. They are almost pushed to the drink, drink of survival. And that's why we need climate finance. It's a question of climate justice. And you know, people who are suffering uh, uh, migration or post-migration because of climate change is not their doing. And the developed countries have not yet held up their promise around adaptation finance. There is a demand for loss and damage finance, which needs to be dealt with. And that's something that media people should be highlighting again and again and again. So yes. over to you, Liz. Yeah, thank you, Ritu. I, I echo what you've said. I, I think 
Of course, it always comes down to resources and it always comes down to who gets to decide who gets what resources um, and the decisions locally around who gets to stay um, and who has to leave or who has to be um, processing what forced migration looks like um, are decided by people who are not from those places and are not having to go through those decisions themselves in most cases. Um, and, and, and I just want to sort of acknowledge that because um, at the same time as there, those decisions are being made by people who aren't having to think about those realities, um, there are questions being posed about, you know, from the communities in the US that are on the forefront of having to experience this. And if we could get resources to move, we should be able to get resources to stay. Um, and I think there is not a nuanced conversation happening inside of the US about the scale of policy uh, changes that are required to existing uh, institutional policies, existing programs inside of the federal, local, and state governments, and how those can better accommodate and save, create the safety nets uh, that are required to actually make this a dignified process. Um, because people are already making these decisions on their own. As I said earlier, people are already moving and there are ripple effects to what those decisions look like. And the more that people with resources make the decisions to move, the more that you end up with the stranded um, populations who don't have um, the financial and social networks to be able to make that decision. Uh, and it's, it's extremely challenging. Um, I also want to add, like, I am personally, um, I am on, that is on my future, right? The place where I live will not look the same that, that it does now. And the house that we live in will, will likely be close to underwater by the time my daughter, you know, is, is the age that my grandmother was when she passed. And so it is personal and it's human. I think, uh, that, the scale of this is really complex and, and I just appreciate y'all beginning to grapple with it, us all beginning to grapple with it. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Um, that is our time today. So thank you to all the participants for joining the webinar. Thank you so much to the speakers for providing, you know, three really different but, but very aligned um, perspectives on this important issue. Um, just a reminder to everyone, you will receive a link with the recording. Um, as well as uh, speaker presentations and slides um, and contact information. Also, just a reminder that um, there's a survey link that was placed in the chat. So um, please take the opportunity to fill that out and provide any feedback on, on this webinar or future events. Um, again, thank you to the, to the panelists. Um, really appreciate your time and perspectives. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you everyone for joining.